Okay, friends, we're back here on Corporate Report Radio, and we have been going over some headlines and taking some calls, but now we are joined on the line, as is our want, every Thursday evening by James Evan Pilato of foodworldorder.com and many other websites, as 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 we've gone over many times. <laughs> I, I always feel like I should get people to get a pen and paper when I'm introducing James, just so they can write down all the websites. But uh, I suppose if I wanted to do it real fast, it would be foodworldorder.com, mediamonarchy.com, cyberspacewar.com, holyhexes.com, and newworldnextweek.com. Did I miss any? Is that okay? Navigatingnetflix.com. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Oh, James. Okay. Well, thanks for coming on. Absolutely. No, thank you. And I know we've both probably referenced before in the past, uh, and it was, I think, you know, the Alex Jones gang would say, any anytime we get hacked, we'll start a new website. I don't even wait to get hacked. If the inspiration <laughs> strikes, <laughs> I'll, I'll start a new one. Um, I, uh, a couple things I just wanted to kind of comment on, because I'm always kind of tuning in, you know, in the first half of your episode in case, you know, there are pertinent things. And you're lucky. I am a communications major i do have a degree says the grocery boy who does an indie podcast but <laughs> you uh you were talking about the you, i believe the sentence was you said preparing for a societal collapse and the arrival of james evan Pilato. i thought was a <laughs> i heard that I was like what what <laughs> um but there is a story you were talking about teens and, and morality and and moral collapse and morality pills and in always such the timely fashion, and you know they were working on it before because of just the production value. But of course, The Onion just two days ago put up a, a whole video, brain dead teen only capable of rolling eyes and texting to be euthanized. Her parents basically said, you know, she, <laughs> all she does is lay there and moan and have her, you know, slave device in front of her and never does anything. So, uh, you know, as always, The Onion does the satire from, from so the well. Department of the too too true to be funny. Exactly. I think another thing that kind of enters into this in a way and maybe sets the stage for our coverage on Food World Order, because as we kind of say that, you know, it's it's food, it's it's health, it's environment and all those kind of related issues. The issue that has blown up here in the States over the last day or so, and James, I don't think we mentioned it on New World Next Week, is the whole hubbub surrounding the Komen Foundation, the Susan G. Komen Anti-Cancer Foundation and Planned Parenthood. Have you seen this story bubbling up, James? I have indeed. I haven't read much past the headlines, but uh, why don't you fill folks in? I got a lot of it actually, in, like I say so many times on these segments, issues like this, I, I get it from my girlfriend as she's kind of watching this online and for the longest time has looked at, you know, the the pink washing is essentially what it's called. And I'm going to discuss a little bit on my show tomorrow there is a documentary that was just at Sundance. It's coming to the Portland International Film Festival soon and is all around. And it's called Pink Ribbons, Inc. And it basically gets into the cancer industry and the sort of run from the cure and all these corporations that put their branding and essentially hardly ever actually donate anything to the cause. But we can put a ribbon on and we feel good about ourselves and we can pat ourselves on the back, but ultimately nothing's happening. Exactly. Out, out. Yeah, let's create a community of... of of people with cancer and make that into the, the point of it instead of actually looking at the underlying causes. And in a way, it maybe even starts to turn women against women. And of course, it's all about divide and conquer. So one hour ago posted the New York Times outcry grows fiercer after funding cut by cancer group. This it's reached the point, James, where this is that kind of story where I stepped outside a little bit ago and there was a couple walking male, female, and they were both kind of chatting, and I heard him say something about, you know, pink gloves, and they were talking about this story. This is pretty much the story that has everybody talking, and it's, again, that kind of wedge issue for election season that brings up, you know, the whole, it's Cracker Barrel versus Whole Foods. Pink gloves. Could have just been talking about a swank Saturday night. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> So, so many things, and, and again, James, you, you know, I, I like to see kind of the, the big picture and perhaps make connections in a way where they may not be there in the physical world, but just looking at the themes and memes in the world. So you know what this Sunday is here in the States. I always call it Black Sunday, but it's the Stuper uh, Bowl. It's oh, everyone's yay. favorite bread and circus event here in the Western world, and it doesn't really get any bigger, I think, than the Stuper Bowl. And it's going to go down in Indianapolis. And in addition to 
everything's for sale. You know, everything has a price tag on it. They're running, and I, I watched the whole thing. They released it. A commercial with Ferris Bueller. It brings back Matthew Broderick as Ferris Bueller to sell a, a car, a Mazda or, or something or other. But he basically is, you know, is his current age is a you know middle aged guy who fakes sick for work and then runs around the city in his car, and it's got all the Ferris Bueller references. And it's just that thing of like, every, you know, all your all your memories and all those things from the past, even if it is you know a, a big Hollywood movie all those things are all for sale and they'll all be kind of pillaged and cannibalized and, and sold back to you later. But I, I'm ranting. The other thing I find interesting is this Egyptian football riot event that's got, you know, I think 74 dead at, at present count and hundreds other, you know, missing or wounded rather. I find that an interesting kind of precursor to the Super Bowl coming up here in the States. As again, we see this, I think, specter swirling around as, you know, the controlled demolition of the economy and it will be you know pitting people against each other good point and there are definitely some political motivations to what was going on in egypt i think and uh, there's mm -hmm. been some speculation that that was uh, actually set up by the security forces too because a lot of the soccer fans were some of the key people in the protests earlier uh -huh. against uh, mubarak so there's some mm -hmm. bad blood there and all of that drama. But anyway, yeah, let's get back to the American Super Bowl drama and <laughs> what's coming up this Sunday. Well, I, I, I thought it was quite important, and I got this actually from ESPN, which, of course, isn't a news source I'm going to cite very often. But they have a, a blog on there called Outside the Lines, and there's one called The File, and they kind of get into you know the behind-the-scenes business and maneuverings in the sports world. Records show critical violations at Super Bowl stadium venues. That's Super Bowl is my wording. What could ruin a fan's once in a lifetime trip to the Super Bowl more than his team's quarterback fumbling away the game in the final seconds? Try a trip to the emergency room courtesy of food poisoning. In just a few days, tens of thousands of fans will converge on Lucas Oil Stadium in Indianapolis for the Super Bowl. They'll be eager to cheer for their teams and as part of their celebrations. They'll likely fork out a small fortune for all kinds of stadium food, from pork to pizza to pot roast sandwiches. And like eating out anywhere, fans will do so on a leap of faith that the food being served will be bacteria and pest free. The file blog from ESPN recently acquired 2011 Marion County Health Department inspection records for the 181 food and beverage outlets inspected at Lucas Oil Stadium and found that 25 or 14 percent of the locations had critical violations that showed up during routine inspections. A 2010 Outside the Lines piece examined food safety at all professional sports stadiums and showed that about 7% of the vendors at Lucas Oil Stadium had racked up critical violations, problems that could lead to illnesses. The nice thing I like is that they provide actually six or seven or so PDFs of all of these records, getting into the even specific, I think, vendors like the Ugly Monkey. <laughs> <laughs> so, James, what a what a shock. I, I can't believe that, you know, the food outside the Lucas Oil Stadium would be suspect. Yeah, who could have, could have thought <laughs> it? Yeah, I, again, I suppose from the Department of the Bleeding Obvious, but still it needs to be said. And uh, and I think once again, this is a this is a perfect example of the congruence of spectacle and corporations and uh, big food and all of this come together mm -hmm. to make you sick. And I, I was looking at a story just the other day, and I, I think I have it bookmarked for the for the news purge of the show coming up tomorrow. Big Sis Napolitano, you know, says unprecedented security for the Super Bowl. And I found myself, I was like, is it unprecedented? Really? You know, and looked back, I was like, let's look at the 2011 Super Bowl. And of course, could find results saying, you know, unprecedented security. It's unprecedented since the last time, because they're always going to ratchet it up, even though there are no specific credible threats and yada yada but the way these kind of events are going to get i mean this is going to be worse than trying to get on an airplane so you're going to be you know prodded and poked and groped and all those things and ultimately you can't take anything in with you so you're at the mercy of the gouging Unfortunately so. What a what a graphic image, but that's pretty much it, isn't it? The mercy, of the <laughs> the mercy yeah, that is kind of a tailgatingly gruesome image and, and again you know and i'm not a i'm i've never been a sports fan you know i grew up in a small town in west virginia and you know never liked sports and found that you know it's, if i had you know long hair and 
you know, didn't like sports, I may as well have worn a tutu or something. But. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can relate in some ways. I've I've always been into sports, actually. I always liked sports, and I always, well, I'm not obviously a player myself, but I always uh, enjoyed watching, and I was always a big hockey fan, being a red-blooded mm. Canadian, but um, I've uh, since discovered that I just can't really get motivated or interested in it anymore, because uh, it's just so utterly detached from my life and everything that's going on in the mm-hmm. world that I mm-hmm. just don't want to devote any of my time or thought to it. You know, and I can and I can see actually if you were involved in actually, you know, in the physical act of of playing, that's totally fantastic. It's it's on so you know it's the institutions of things, whether it's institutionalized sports or institutionalized medicine or schooling or banking or religion or any of those things that, that the problems arise. Sucks the life right out of it. <laughs> Speaking of the UN. The United Nations claims the world lacks enough food and fuel as the population soars. And this is from firstpost.com. The world is running out of time to make sure there's enough food, water, and energy to meet the needs of a rapidly growing population and to avoid sending up to 3 billion people into poverty, a United Nations report warned on this past Monday, January 30th. As the world's population looks set to grow to nearly 9 billion by 2040 from 7 billion now, and the number of middle-class consumers increases by 3 billion over the next 20 years, the demand for resources will rise exponentially. And fortunately, you can actually get the PDF report, and I I've, I've provide that link for you. Resilient people, resilient planet, a future worth choosing. James, we've discussed so many, many, many times that... If they wanted to feed the world, we could do it. If they wanted to teach the world, we could do it. If we wanted to clothe the world, you know, we could do it and then some. But that's not part of the agenda from from what I can gather, is it? Well, guess who has an idea along those lines? The UN? (laughs) Well, the UN, but also uh, Bill Gates. Bill Gates, he recently came out with his annual letter to the, uh, from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. He writes an annual letter about the world's problems and what he's going to do about them. And one of them was, uh, was basically about GMO and how uh, it's so great and it'll be the thing that will feed people in the future. He didn't come out and use GMO or biotechnology in the letter itself, but in an interview he gave with the Associated Press about it, he talked about, oh, GMOs are you know, the way to go. And of course, they have to be regulated on a you know, one-by-one basis and we have to do studies and things like that. But ultimately, that's what's going to save people from from starving to death. And I think we just said last week, of course, that you know studies have shown that California alone throws throws enough of, throws away enough food to fill thirty some staple centers a year. So again, it's 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 lies, and they want you to believe that the population is exploding, and that's why they can use these sort of Planned Parenthood psyops to get people even more riled up. Where ultimately, James, you've you've done this on on podcast episodes, discuss the you know the population situation, in that it's negative. It's only basically older people are living longer because of medical technology and and advancements and things. But other countries and people aren't having kids. Demographic winter, and I'm right That's there in it. the thick of it here in Japan, where. Um it's I can't even I don't even know what the uh, the the replacement rate is now something like one point two children per couple, hmm. so um, absolutely it's a it's a dying world in so many respects and the only thing that's keeping America growing is immigration. Hmm. Well, that <laughs> James, you're good at this. You just set the stage <laughs> to to move into the next the next story, and I think I'll I'll preface this again by saying you know you you've again done so much work on the anthropogenic global warming fraud but that's not to say you know is the environment being jacked completely absolutely but it's mostly being done by the military and by the multinational corporations who don't care about you and don't care about your family they care about their ipos and their bottom lines and and all of those things so of course yeah we are doing things to damage the environment but you know, is it you and maybe your car or you didn't turn off the lights and those things. They want you to, you know, they, to feel the guilt. But we do see all around, you know, sh- strange weather, isn't it? And that may be, you know, the 50 degree days, you know, we're having this week in Portland or it can be the odd weather events in other places. But how much of that is the sun, James? But drought and cold snap cause food crisis in northern Mexico, a drought that a government official called the most severe Mexico has ever faced, 
has left 2 million people without access to water and coupled with a cold snap has devastated cropland in nearly half the country. The government in the past week has authorized $2.63 billion in aid, including potable water, food, and temporary jobs for the most affected areas, rural communities in 19 of Mexico's 31 states. But officials warn that no serious relief was expected for at least another five months when the rainy season typically begins in earnest. James, I believe I also saw a story about shipping water into a community in Texas, of course, just, just across the border. And the the update to this, and, you know, I'm not Pollyanna, but I firmly believe there, you know, a couple quick moves we could actually, you know, solve a lot of the world's problems. But a video update, actually, I believe it's from the Associated Press. Mexico drought so bad, even the drug trade is affected, which, of course, you know, massive, <laughs> massive marijuana growth, you know, in Mexico. And, you know, and even, you know, we have to here in the States, we've got to get our hemp oil and things. We've got to get it shipped in from Canada because, oh, God, we, you know, we can't use that devil we weed have here. That, absolutely. We can't <laughs> have that in America. Absolutely. Well, there you go. So I guess the CIA is going to be missing out a bit of its cut uh, there from the, uh, the, the drought. But uh, absolutely. Mm. Uh, and again, it, you can almost set your timer by how long it'll take for someone to blame global warming for this and uh, mm -hmm. human causes. But uh, but absolutely, uh, again, this is just a, a terrible situation. And, and what I mean, what's the real what, what do we take out of this? What's the real point? Well, obviously, it, it's that uh, the, the government clearly just isn't set up to to face this or to be able to do anything in in the wake of such a large scale catastrophe, which is why I think people have to be relying more on uh, on their communities and people they know than waiting for, you know, mommy or daddy government to st step in with some sort of, you know, potable water and food and whatever they claim to be offering, just like we saw uh, the U.S. government doing so generously in the wake of what Katrina and things like that. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. On, you know, and on so many levels, it seems like, you know, the, our three different countries, Canada and the States and Mexico, you know, we are being engineered to ultimately kind of all collapse into one another, I think. Unfortunately so. And uh, what hurts so one of those countries is going to hurt all three if uh, if things continue to proceed and, mm -hmm. and the uh, lines continue to be blurred. So we'll have to. We'll have to see how this plays out. But at any rate, we're right up against the break. So why don't we take a short break? And hopefully James will grace us with his presence for the final <laughs> few minutes of, uh, of the broadcast. And we can go over the latest binge and purge on foodworldorder.com. There's a man who leads a life of danger. There's a man who leads a life of danger, and his name is James Evan Pilato, and he comes to you from foodworldorder.com, where we're going over the latest binge and purge, the roundup of all of the most important news uh, on the food, health, and environment uh, radar in the last uh, few days. And the latest one is the 2 2 binge and purge super bees count. Fudgula and more, which again you can get from the from the front page of foodworldorder.com. So James, lots of stories here, but what is, you want to well, I just like that I, I got you to say Count Fudgula. <laughs> I think that's the first time I have ever Probably. said that. So and and I'll I'll save explanation for that for the for the podcast episode tomorrow. So I'll remind folks, episode two forty nine goes up tomorrow. But right here and now on the February second binge and purge. Monsanto killed the bees to make way for its super bee. This comes from PackAlertPress.com. Soon to be whistleblower who worked for Monsanto will be releasing documents detailing how Monsanto planned to kill off bee colonies in order to introduce a new and improved species of bee that will, of course, only pollinate Monsanto crops. They provide uh, a couple links Businessweek.com, Monsanto buys company researching the death of bees. And some of the other things surrounding this. So we'll have to kind of wait and see. It sounds somewhat speculative to me at this point, James. But but of course, we you know more whistleblowers from the inside would would be great. I I couldn't agree more. I mean, I, absolutely, you're right. We do have to take this with a pinch of salt until we see what comes out and how it comes out. But um, but if this story does pan out, just that story alone. Out of all of the stories that I have ever covered on CorbettReport.com, that story alone would be enough 
for me to, to be really concerned about the future of humanity and the world as a whole. And the idea that a corporation could even consider doing something like that in the name of trying to, to for, further their control of the world really shows what kind of just outright total gangsterish, thuggish evil that we're dealing with that in, in the, right in the heart of these companies that, that, that really do play with the world like, like it's their little toy. Mm -hmm. Well, let's try and wrap it up on a positive note, James. From Super Bees to Pink Slime. Pink Slime removed from McDonald's hamburgers, but of course other food additives remain. And they cite the 2004 documentary Super Size Me, created and directed by West Virginia native Morgan Spurlock. But they also talk about Jamie Oliver, who also did the first season of Food Revolution in West Virginia. But on Wednesday, McDonald's announced the product was no longer used in their burgers. That would be the pink slime, discarded beef cuts treated with ammonium hydroxide. You can get the link, see the report from time. The decision was a result of our efforts to align our global standards for how we source beef around the world. Todd Bacon, Senior Director of Quality Systems for McDonald's, said in a statement, That's all well and good, except that fast food meals are still jam-packed with other strange-sounding food additives. The IB Times has a short list, and it ain't very appetizing, James. Oh, I, I have no doubt about that, <laughs> absolutely. And uh, yeah, exactly. I mean, this might be some sort of, I, I wonder if they think this is going to be some sort of PR win. Oh, we've taken out the pink slime. Uh -huh. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> Which then makes you wonder, it's like, oh, well, good God, what else is in there? What was in there, you know, before? I, I, I'd love to think, I, you know, I'm always, especially being on the West Coast now, being away from, you know, my home state of West Virginia. I, you know, I find it really positive that these two things kind of come out of West Virginia and that it could maybe be the kind of catalyst for, for more real change. Which, again, James, starts in your own kitchen. Real change starts at home. That's the exact point. All right, James, thank you so much, uh, as always, for this roundup. And for next week, next Thursday, I hope everyone tunes in and treats James real nice as he guest hosts the program. And uh, that's it for me for tonight and actually for this week. Tomorrow night will be a rebroadcast, and next week we'll have some guest hosts. So uh, all things being equal, I'll see you in about a week and a half's time. So take care. <laughs>